Is it going live? Are we live? We are live. Right, so I am recording my first live video since I've returned back for the bike trip. I am joined with Christopher Padaski. Do you want to say hello? Hey guys, how you doing? So that's Chris. Chris is on uh, in Canada at the moment. Where are you in Canada, mate? Uh, I'm in Ottawa, so yeah, capital. It's a big city. So for this podcast, we're going to be talking about stoves and i've decided to record it live in my video but this is for chris's podcast so this is the youtube live introduction then chris is going to do his thing if you've got any comments or chats about stoves or gear feel free to send it in onto the youtube onto the live and i will we'll answer them if they're if they're good questions and we feel that they will help to the podcast discussion so we're going to be talking all about cooking stoves um anything to add mate no man, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. stoked to be doing this. No, oh, thank you. It's always good to speak to you. Chris was in my YouTube videos back in Cambodia. He appeared in Thailand, so he's appeared in a few videos. But uh, this is where Chris is now. He's on my phone. There you can see him here. So in the future, we'll hopefully get both of our faces live. But we thought we'd go, we'd go old school, <laughs> rudimentary at the moment. So yeah, and, uh, and at the same time, all these. Podcast that we're recording and that we're going to record together will be on the Bike Tour Adventures podcast, so you can find it there as well if you uh, if you want to just listen. So that's it. Any podcast player you're on, Spotify, iTunes, uh, Stitcher, all the rest of it. If you go and put Bike Tour Adventures in, you'll find Chris and lots of interviews with lots of bike tour people. Some of it about gear, and that is what we're about to get to now, right, mate? I, I will I will stop presenting to YouTube. Now, and I will go into full on interview mode. Podcast mode. Podcast All right, mode. Welcome to the Bike Tour Adventures Gear Reviews. Uh, we are your hosts, Chris Vanaski and Adam Hugel. Uh, when I thought of the idea of the Bike Tour Adventure Gear Reviews, it, it kind of came naturally that I would ask Adam, who had basically just finished a 20,000 kilometer bike tour, to join me as a co host. Uh, Adam has literally been around since the beginning of Bike Tour Adventures, and I'm not just talking as my first guest, but he was also there when I was when I was going through name choices for the podcast, and I was building that website. And then those two weeks while he was staying over at my house, this all kind of played out right in that time frame. So um, we all get on pretty well, which I think is a good thing, and uh, we just want to share our cycling experiences with listeners. So let's get this first episode going. Um, Adam, we've got a pretty exciting topic to talk about today. What are we talking about, buddy? So today, mate, we have decided out of all the plethora of things we can talk about, let's talk about cooking and stoves. A man's got to eat. <laughs> a man's got to I think that I think it's quite uh, it's quite uh, ideal that we're talking about cooking. I think it's my favourite topic, bar cycling. So. <laughs> And, and we shared quite a lot of meals when we we biked together. We uh, we cooked a lot of our own meals, and also we got we got fed by the locals. So this will be. Uh... Well, Freeloaded at my house for two weeks. Yeah, <laughs> free loaded at your house. <laughs> you were good about it, yeah. I, th- I remember we had a lot of kimchi and a lot of Korean food. That was pretty good, right? Oh, and you got really annoyed because I think I ate your honey. Oh, that's good. <laughs> honey, by the way, one of the best bike touring foods out there. I think it's possibly the best. Yeah, as long as peanut butter and honey. Peanut and butter, butter and honey, mate. So I think um, <clears throat> I think what we need to think about when uh, deciding on which kind of stove to use is there's kind of some key questions which we'll try to tie back into at the end here. But like, first one is where you're going, um, and that really plays a lot of a lot of importance based on fuel accessibility. How long you're going for? I mean, that might determine what kind of stove you want to bring with you. Um, how often are you cooking? You know, if you're if you're going on a trip to Southeast Asia and you're not cooking at all, is there really need to have an expensive, good quality stove? And um, are you solo? Or are you cooking for two? Or cooking for four? Those kind of things. What do you think, Adam? Yeah, there's a, there's also the thought: Do you need to bring a stove or not? I think it's people will expect if you're on a bike tour, you're going to need one. But there's definitely an argument if you're in somewhere like Thailand or most of Southeast Asia, the food there is affordable, delicious. And maybe if you're going to be in the, the more beaten path and you're not going to be really remote, you could get away with not even taking one. Yeah. And I lived in Malaysia for, uh, for seven years, and 
we had actually figured out that it was cheaper to eat out every meal of the day than <laughs> yeah. to go to the store and buy high quality food. And you're never going to make food as good as, as that person down on the street corner that's been doing it the whole life. The food they make would be amazing. Yeah, and they, I mean, they use cheaper quality oils. You know, they're using like your palm oil and stuff to cook, and they use cheap quality rice and everything. But I mean, doesn't matter. It tastes good. And, and you really want to carry a 10 kilo bag of rice on your back of your bike. And, yeah, you love rice, but you know. Yeah, and I think the stove you bring as well depends on the the, the group size. If you are going to be cooking with a group, having um, a bigger stove and bigger cook set obviously makes a big difference to being if you're by yourself and you're just cooking for one. Yeah, so I think we're going to talk about um, various types of stoves today. So I think we both have a lot of experience with different types, um, particularly you, Adam, actually, but uh, multi-fuel stoves, alcohol stoves, canister, gas stoves, and... Um, I even threw in the idea is the uh, wood burning stoves, but I've never actually used one, so we'll talk about that when it comes time. But um, Adam, you guys, you you use the Whisper Light, right? The international. Yeah. So the Whisper Light is the it's the stove I've used. Mine's in a bit of a bad state at the moment. Is by that I mean it's, it looks black. It's covered in soot, and but it's a multi fuel stove which comes with lots of little adapters, which they all go inside the like stove area. And it's, yeah, it's, it's the, I think a lot of the bike touring people I meet on the road have this stove. So it's obviously quite popular for a reason. Yeah, and I think um, that's the Whisper Light International. They also make one that's not the international version and it is not multi fuel. So you gotta make sure if you're getting Whisper Light by MSR that you do get the international one. Yeah, so, that's really good to know. I didn't actually know that. Yourself and go, oh, yeah. deal. What do you know what fuel the other one takes? Um, yeah, oh, I was reading about it. It's just um, just white gas? gas, just white yeah, gas. Just so, white, white gas, gas is like when, when you're using the MSR Whisper Light International, white gas is what they recommend for you to use. Uh, the yeah. only thing is with white gas is it's expensive compared to other fuels, it's definitely not the cheapest of fuels, and it's only really easy to get all the white gas when you're in somewhere like North America. If you're in Central Asia or even Southeast Asia, good luck trying to translate what white gas is and trying to find it. I found it pretty impossible. Yeah. Now, how much does the Whisper Light cost you? Good question. Um, I don't remember. Is it, is it about £70? Oh, yeah, that's what I guess. Yeah, 140 dollars $130? Okay, that makes sense. And especially if you're buying it with – it comes with like a little bit like maintenance kit. So it comes in like a red box and it's probably about sunglasses case size, maybe a bit thinner. And in the maintenance kit, you can buy that separately. I think that costs about $20, $30. But that, you, I didn't use it for the first 12 months of my trip, but it became invaluable later on in the trip. And it saved me having to buy a whole new stove and nothing worse than your stove not working if you're in the middle of nowhere. And you right. see, suddenly like you've got pasta like you you want to cook and you've got nothing else to eat and you're having to cook like you're like the maintenance kit comes into its own then. Did you have any problems with it other than uh, that one time? Uh, I had a few a few little times and it was all just through wear and tear. If you use a stove every single day for eighteen months, which is pretty much what I did, it's um it's gonna it's gonna things are gonna wear out. It's got little rubber like kind of washers in there and they degrade over time. And there's, there's just the working parts inside. It's a really simple stove. And I think that's what one of the real attractions to it is, is I now know how to fully take it apart and I can replace every single part on it. So I will never need to buy, hopefully, touch wood, a brand new one. I can just buy replacement parts and it just will last me a lifetime. Yeah, that's the good thing with the Whisper Light is they, um, MSR have been making this since like the 80s or something and people still use their original ones. You know, they're... Maybe that's a bad move on MSR's part. Come on, MSR. Yeah, the, 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 the do you know what they do, and, uh, do? Is they, they keep bringing out, like I saw, they get, you get the fuel bottle, and the traditional one's red, big red bottle. And I saw some, like, uh, I think it was like 50th anniversary edition bottles that were white. And I saw a load of them in RAI in Alaska. So I, so I, I bought one of them, and then I needed two bottles. So having two fuel bottles was really good for the remote areas where I didn't know if I'd be able to fill up fuel. Um, how easy was it to maintain it? Maintain it? Well, I, I suppose like initially 
you don't really think about maintaining when you first buy it. So for the first 12 months, I did zero maintenance. So in itself, that's pretty easy. That's oh, pretty good to get a year out of it. Yeah, and then, and then after a year of me just abusing it, and by abusing it, I mean putting uh, like car fuel, so gas, like actual car gas, car fuel into it. So I'd go to a, a car petrol station is what we'd call it in the UK, or a gas station, and yeah. I would fill my bottles for about a dollar in the States, or if you're in China – the equivalent of 50 cents and you just fill that fill your bottles and that would last me about seven days but that fuel is really mucky fuel it's really black and sooty and yeah. dirty but it's cheap and it works and yeah i suppose it gets clogged up after after a year of constant use and Did it, you ever use diesel? no i always use no, I always use the unleaded variant i don't I'm, you, can, you can use diesel i was reading about that i could imagine yeah i think i I read as well that using the fuel with the, uh, do you know you often get numbers next to the, the gas, like how which quali- yeah. the lower the number, so really the lower the quality, the better, because uh, because it means it's got less additives in it, which means uh, okay. it's like that's you last for cars really, whereas for your stove, you just want it to burn, so it's uh, the cheaper the better. Oh, good to know. That's kind of cool. Um, how about getting used to using it, like the priming and all that stuff? Does, uh, is there quite a learning curve there, or is it just kind of stupid easy? Yeah, oh, I think it's fairly easy. Um, I say that having used it a lot, but what is difficult is to is to te- is to gauge the temperature, particularly on the, the, this this one. It's either raging hot or crazy hot. <laughs> There's no in between. It's just like it's going to. And spe- the one of the things you've got to do is you let a little bit of gas into it. It pools like a little bit of the liquid into the bottom of the stove and then you set it on fire. And if you've got too much liquid in there, it's going to go crazy and set fire to your face. So you need to make sure that your eyebrows are kept away when you're lighting it. Or get your cycling partner to do it for you. <laughs> get somebody like Chris Podaski to do it and watch him, watch him lose his eyebrows. So I, I had one of these about 20 years ago when I was in the army and, um, and I was leaving the barracks at the end of the summer and I forgot it in the bottom drawer and I, I was like, oh shit, because I and it was a nice one too. It paid like two hundred bucks for it. Right. Um. So I never got a ton of use out of it because I just uh, I didn't have that long and I forgot about it and lost it. One of the reasons I took I took this stove on my world bike tour was because the stove is you can use it anywhere in the world, and it's really good at high altitude. So your traditional stoves that use like screw on gas canisters at high altitude they're less reliable. Whereas multi fuel, where you're using liquid fuel, is better when it's super cold, and it's better when it's uh, when when you're at altitude, and that's why these type of stoves are used by mountaineers in uh, in places like the Himalayas and the big old mountain ranges. Yeah, and these are the cheapest ones, so I mean that definitely is something to consider: is do how how much do you need a good quality stove with you because. They're, they're not cheap, and there are alternatives, which we'll talk about in a minute, that are a lot cheaper. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good time to mention the uh, MSR Dragonfly. You know what that is, Al? No. What's that? No, so the, the, I guess um, what, I've, what I've heard is, uh, I, I haven't used it personally, but there's two types of stoves. One's are boiling and one are simmering, and the Dragonfly kind of distributes the gas more so that it's not as um, as intense a flame, like you said, you're torching or you're torching really hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's a little bit lighter, and um, it just allows you to, to simmer food instead of just burning everything you try to cook. Oh, that's important. good. I suppose. So, yeah, it's really like, great for boiling water, but then if you want to like make a, a cheese pasta thing, it might just end up being like, a big burnt clump at the bottom. Right. right. I've not considered that. Yeah, that sounds really good as a feature. Because often... Yeah, it's a little bit longer to boil water. Yeah. Be, uh, with, for, like, what does it take, like two, three minutes? If that, sometimes it's rapid. Yeah. So that's fast. Um, but anyways, the dragonfly, I believe it's called dragonfly, or dragon fire, dragonfly, dragon light, maybe that's it. I don't know, something like that. Dragonfly, I believe. Anyways, um, check it out. It's, it's something to consider. So the second type of stove is what I use, and um, I, I bought it in Sweden, so I feel very Swedish yacht to, to have used the Swedish stove in Sweden. Um, and it's the Trangia set. So right. uh, that's not a hot stove. Yeah. Yeah, what's that what's that like compared to the MSR stuff? I think it's it's an amazing system. Like they it's like an all inclusive system that's all packs up into like one pile the size of a pot. And um 
and I bought this Transy 27, which is kind of made for one to two people, and it was really good. And I used it for some ultralight running stuff where I was. Um, oh, is it that? Is it that small? Well, the build itself is small, so it's um, it's probably about six centimeters across by five centimeters deep. Okay. And that's just the stove. But then, like with the Transia twenty seven set, and they make a twenty five, which is slightly bigger. Which I don't understand how the numbers going smaller, and bigger, <laughs> right. but whatever. Um, Sweden, you know, yeah. Um. Anyway, see the, the Transia. It comes with like a stand for it, and then you got your windscreen, and it's a big clunky thing, and then you have your two two pots, and then you have a pot uh, pan, and then you have your gripper handle. Um. So I ditched most of that, and I converted mine by buying the transient mini stand so it's just a little stand that the, the stove fits in right now, they've, they've the got a really sorry go ahead. i was going to say they've got a really good reputation transier so it's and it's all, i think that's like the second stove that you'll often hear long distance bike tourists will i met it quite a lot that were very anti msr i think it's people yeah. that, that don't want to be in the popular group and they they want to be a bit left field, and they they raved about these Transgeo stoves. Yeah, they're great. Um, I would say I was on it for that reason, but yeah, um, I, I can get like that too sometimes. I guess. <laughs> yeah. no, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go with the top brand. I'm not gonna go with the one that's most popular. You know, but, everyone um, likes an underdog. In this case, I was living in Sweden. My landlord had one, and they said, "Here, you can borrow this." And I used it a few times. It's like, oh man, this is freaking awesome. And um, so I bought one. But it cost me about, it was pretty cheap. Like, let's say the whole set was about 45 Canadian dollars, so like 20 pounds. Right. And so when it comes just to, to efficient, like, yeah, value for dollar, I think it, was, it, it comes out on top. Probably one of the cheapest options of stoves. Um, and, and we love cheap, mate. Anything cheap is good if it works well. You know, if you can get something that's going to last as long and you're paying less for it, bonus. Yeah, and, and the fuel burner only weighs about 108 grams, and you can even get lighter options out there if you're searching for alcohol stove. What uh, what fuel does that what, what fuel does that stove use? So it's multi fuel as well. So I use generally methyl hydrate, <coughs> um, white gas. You can use rubbing alcohol. Um, right. as long as it's like the 99 percent. You can use petrol. So um, I've just got a comment in here um, from one yeah. of the listeners, and they're saying that um, diesel is hard to light. And that's, I've never tried it on a transient, but I don't know how it would be on an MSR either. So imagine, on, imagine diesel because it's an oil, right? It doesn't. It's hard to get it to vaporize. Right. So, so that makes sense. Yeah. So I think that's why using using the uh, unleaded variety is usually better. And you can, if you can yeah. get hold of diesel, you can get hold of unleaded nearly nearly all the time. Well, I don't think the MSR is for like is like a, a new high tech diesel car. Like I remember my parents' <laughs> diesel car of the eighties. You had to plug it in all night to get it to work. Yeah. And, uh, so, so on that note, yeah, you you probably have to prime it really, and it would probably be really difficult. I think it's like diesel would probably be your last option. I know you can use kerosene with the uh, MSR International, so I imagine you can with other ones as well. But you need. You, yeah, you can use it with the stoves. I think Transit you can use just about anything. You can yeah. Use your steel fat too, if you wanted. I don't know. You There's like a there. little thing. I don't know the name of it, but it's like this little kind of adapter which controls the amount of liquid that comes into the stove and you get different ones depending on what fuel you're using. So that yeah. that usually comes with the stove, which uh, just I made the error once of changing it and putting the wrong one in and my stove didn't work and I, I spent hours trying to fix it and it was something oh, really, cool. really simple of me putting a kerosene filter in when I wasn't using kerosene. There was one other whisper, whisper light that's really awesome. I thought I should mention it. Um, and it's it's it is a whisper light, but it's a uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, but it's its ability is that you can actually hook up a gas canister to it too. So it comes with an extra. Oh, the, the whisper light universal. Is that the one? Yeah. Yeah. So I've just seen it here. Yeah, that's a really cool feature because often that that gives you loads of, uh, I suppose. You're flexible depending on what fuel you can get hold of. And in Europe, getting hold of gas canisters is super easy, and in North America as well. And it keeps things clean, so you just have to use that. And you use the other one when you're in places where you have no other options. And, uh, yeah. So, yeah, that looks really cool. Yeah. And do you know what? Ultimately, if it's cooking your food and it's hot, 
I, mean, I know this. We're going to be talking about different stoves and the pros and cons. But if if it works, that's the most important thing for me. Is if it's reliable and you're in the middle of nowhere and you're going to get a hot meal because. Yeah, I was going to say just because like there's nothing worse than being in the middle of a really remote location and your stove breaking. It's the worst, right. worst thing in the world. So reliability is so high on my list. Mm -hmm. And there's one thing you're never going to have a problem with with Transia is that it it'll never break because it's literally a piece of metal that's rolled inside itself, so the gas pulls up on the inside right. where the uh, the plumbing is or whatever, and there's no moving parts, no working parts. You just fill it and then light it. That's really cool. I should try um, one of the keys to the Transia is um, if you do run out, like if the stove burns itself dry, don't pour new fuel in it right away. Probably a good idea to wait a couple minutes so it's not uh, so hot and it doesn't combust and then blow up an entire bottle that you're holding in your hand as well. Um, I've never had this happen, but you want to make sure if you're adding fuel that there's no fire going on because, you know, stupid doesn't last long in the wilderness. And um, that might be the end of you. Yeah, I've just also had another comment come in there saying kerosene is hard to light as well. Had a nightmare mm -hmm. with my whisper light. That's come from supple side down. Good so, to know. yeah, I, I've never, I've only ever used exclusively white gas or um, unleaded car fuel, both mm -hmm. of which have had uh, white gas is brilliant. It's super easy, uh, but it's expensive. If you go to somewhere like REI, they only serve it, serve like serve it. They only sell it in really big, like kind of two liter, one liter size things. Yeah. You don't need that much. So, so for me, it's like I, I've stayed with warm showers hosts occasionally that have end up having loads of it left over, and they've just said, "Do you want to help yourself?" And that's when I've used white gas. Yeah, I've always got enough. I've got a fill up. I've got a big bottle of uh, methyl hydrate, which goes by different names in different countries, so it's always worth worth searching out. Um, I've got a big gallon jug of it in my garage, and same thing. Anybody that ever comes here, if they need to fill up, bam, just fill them up. Um, I paid, I think, about fifteen dollars Canadian, so eight pounds, nine pounds. Yeah, for four liters, so that's pretty. Cheap. Well, that's pretty good, and I think that really works if you're setting up from a bike trip from your house. When you're on a long distance bike tour and you're fl or you're flying, that's another consideration: is how are you gonna get fuel when you land? And if you're yeah. if you're taking a like you're gonna have to if you're taking a multi fuel stove and you've got one of the containers. You really need to make sure that's empty. You can't be flying with that, or you're going to get in a lot of trouble. So it's and, and, and it's also flying if you're flying to another country with a like a butane propane fuel bottle. Do you know the gas canisters? Mm -hmm. You can't take that either. So that can be if you're if you're going somewhere. I don't know. Let's say I was going to go on a bike tour next week to Morocco from the UK, which is something I'm considering. I've got to think about what stove am I going to take with me. Because if I take the, the smallest one I've got, which works with a gas canister, am I going to be able to get hold of gas canisters when I'm in Morocco? Or do I just... Yeah, cool. We'll so get... like I was going to say, to finish off the alcohol stove, so the one downside with the Trangia is it takes about 10 minutes to boil water. So it takes longer to cook your food, and you end up using more fuel in the long run, where the whisper lights and stuff, I mean, they, they vaporize the, the liquid yeah or whatever you want to call it and um and so it burns really quick and strong but the the transia it takes a long time and i find that a 500 milliliter water bottle filled with uh, fuel okay i don't carry i don't carry proper bottles that don't break down um it lasts me about four to five days if i use it two to three times a day so just depending how much you cook it um, yeah which is not great you know yeah, I think out of my international one, I, I, I get a week of using it, a week usage, seven days. That's using it three times a day. So, yeah, it, it's quite good in that sense. The bright side is there's no maintenance with this mm -hmm. one. It's super light. And um, if you can even find how to make a, an alcohol stove out of a pop can, um, there's I think there's some videos on YouTube. You can take a pop can, you cut it down, and... You just follow the instructions and you can make a, an alcohol stove that weighs like 25 grams or something stupid like that. Or even better than a pop can is a beer can. <laughs> the beer can, beer can stove. Yeah, they do look really cool. And, and yeah. You, yeah, I'm using alcohol fuel. Another consideration here is come from um, Bikepacking, the, the YouTube website, uh, the YouTube channel. 
It said that try finding alcohol fuel in a Muslim country. It can be really difficult. Well, have you had any experience with that in Malaysia? Um, you know, you can find it in Malaysia, but um, yeah, man, I don't remember. I did buy stuff. It wasn't, uh, no, you actually you could. You could just go to literally any hardware store. Yeah. And you could get, um, oh, what's it called? It's got, it's got um, methanol. So it's got methanol in it, so you can't drink it. It would poison you and kill you. So <laughs> right. Basically, methanol is ethanol, al ethyl alcohol, uh, and with it, methanol added in, which is a poisonous substance, so that you can't drink it. And I suppose um, it really does depend. If you're in Saudi Arabia, it might be different to if you're in a, yeah. if you're in somewhere with, like, say, Malaysia, which does have different religions and different things. So I think that that is a consideration. It's looking. Oh, another thing I did before I set up for my big bike trip was googled the translations for these different fuels. So if I wanted to find white gas in China, having the symbol for that and trying to find out what shops to find it. It said- yeah, Can you tell us what that, what that word was? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, imagine if I just did it. <laughs> I'd mean, absolutely have stumped you then, wouldn't I? Yeah, <laughs> I could have said anything. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, so I'm using a really tiny stove and I'm holding it now. It's like the length of my finger and it weighs nothing. It's so small. Uh, it's called it's <laughs> all of them. It's called the MSR Pocket Rocket. It's uh yeah, it's really it's quite a cheap stove. It comes in a little case, which I immediately discarded because that's what I generally do. But um, it falls away, away really small, and it just screws onto the top of a, a gas canister, and then you're good to go. That's it. It's got no priming function, so you would need a lighter, and I suppose that's how they've reduced a lot of the weight is the primer. Uh, but yeah, it, it works really well. It's really easy to control because it's got the uh, it's got a, like an adjustment handle, which is really good, so you can simmer and you can boil really quickly. Um, so yeah, I'm really for for lightweight travel. If I was to need a stove, I think this is going to be my choice. And you just have to have a gas canister for that, right? So UK is great, Europe is great. Yeah, so I'm using, I mean, you can get different size ones, obviously, but I'm using a one of the MSR like branded ones. It's a butane fuel. Um, okay. It says it's got between one and two hours of burn time. And this is the bigger variety. So you've got one or two hours of cooking in that stove. So depending on what you're cooking, yeah, it depends on what you're cooking. Let's say if you're cooking oatmeal, porridge, it, you, you're going to just boil the water and then throw the porridge in. So it's really quite quick. But if you're going to be burning, like cooking rice, that can take like 15 minutes. So I try not to cook rice or anything that takes a long time when I'm using this type of stove. Do you know how much that little pocket rocket costs? Yeah, let's have a look. I think I'm going to tell you the exact current price at the moment. MSR. Pocket rocket. What does Google say? Pocket. Ah, the pocket rocket. It costs. Uh, you can get it from Decathlon for sixty pounds. Okay. So no, oh, no. Uh, yeah, sixty pounds. It'll cost you. Um, yeah, between sixty and eighty pounds generally. Okay. And, so and, not so cheap, but uh, still at the same time, it's um. Uh, for the size and the, the versatility of it within Europe, for instance, or America. Yeah. Pretty good. Also a Pocket Rocket 2, which exists as well, oh, wow. which when I'm looking okay. at it, I'm looking at the pictures of it, it, it looks identical. I'm sure there's different features, but um, I've, I think I've got the Pocket Rocket 1, I believe, and it, it, it works pretty well. Sweet. Um, you've also used the jet boil, right? Like, I think this is kind of cool system to talk about. I've, I've never used it. I mean, I've seen it used by other friends of mine. Um, I think it's got some good advantages and disadvantages. What's, uh, what's your experience with that? So when I, I, used, I used it when I was in the army. So I was a infantry guy. So we used to cook all our food. And the, the jet boil is good in a way that because it's, got a, it, it's all self-contained, so it comes with the, the function to cook and it comes with a pot. So it cooks water really well if you're just boiling water. Now, if you're trying to cook food, it's not as good because it's, it's you can't take the, the heat off the pan. 
uh, as such. Okay. So it's all contained. So for if you're literally just boiling water, if you're making brews, which the the Brits love a brew, a cup of tea, uh, it's really good. And one the thing with the military is you get ration packs, which you just used to throw in to the water, and it boils the ration pack, and then you take the meal out, boil in a bag. It's kind of like a camp a camping meal for them. It's really good. It's quick. It's convenient. It's all one package. Uh, but for me, I want a bit more, like on a bike tour, I want flexibility to be able to cook my own foods and to be able to add my own pan so I can take it off the heat. And that's the, I think, the real big trade off that you're going to get with a jet boil. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, the jet boil, I think they make a couple of models that, like you said, you can't regulate the gas. So it's, it's just on full blast. And then that's like the flash and the zip model. They're the kind of cheaper models. They do make some more expensive ones yeah. that you can regulate. But now you're getting into the price of a, a whisper light or maybe even a bit more. Actually, a fair bit more, I think. And and I think you're limited. You're limited to gas canisters. So if you're going to spend that kind of money, why not get something that's a multi-fuel stove that'll take you through up the highest mountains in the world and through any situation, right? This branding is really good. As in, everyone knows what a jet boil is. In the military, people don't know MSR particularly. It's not a really well-known brand. But in the military, everyone knows a jet boil. It's even just referred to as stove. It's like, oh, get your jet boil out. It's like they just say that term even if it's not a jet boil. So that I think that that's the reason they can charge quite a lot of money for what is that ultimately there's stoves out there that do the same job and more jobs for a cheaper price. Yeah, and very similar to a jet boil, like they make this system where it's a uh, sit on top with the canister, big mug type thing, and they're now producing their own version of it because they realize that there's um, there's a lot of even money to be made in that. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and it, and yeah, I suppose if it works, it works for a lot of people. It, it really does depend on what you're doing. If you're just cooking hot water, hot, hot water alone, jet boil is great. If you're cooking meals, I would look at something else. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so I think it's great in a sense, like you said, but it's also only good really for one person, right? You know, you don't have the size and the capacity to cook a lot of food for two people, especially if you're you're doing heavy days on the bike and you need to get lots of food into your body. Do you mean with a jet boil? Yeah. Yeah, I I, I have the zip version, so the jet boil zip. That's a really small yeah. one. Um, okay. It's it really is just for one person that so. And, and you can't, I suppose, with any other stove, you can just buy a, a pan that is bigger. And I suppose that's part of it, is that you don't have to buy a pan if you bought a jet boil. You already have it. So you are kind of reducing the cost there. But, yeah, definitely it isn't something for two people I wouldn't consider um, really, really big enough, especially the amount I eat. Yeah, I hear you. Um, have you used any wood-burning stoves before? No. Like, like, canisters where you put the twigs in and... I've not. I've, I'm looking at the comments in the, into the video now, and a lot of people here are recommending to use um, a, a bush box and just need twigs to cook. Um, I've never tried it. I've never done it. I, I wonder how effective that is and what a pain in the backside that could be. Is it easy? It would be really good, but maybe like if you're in the middle of Saudi Arabia, you'd be like, oh, fuck, I wish I could find it. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, when, I was, when I was in northern Alaska, cycling from the Arctic Circle, where it's tundra and there's no twigs. It's just, no. so that for me and my journeys, that would never have worked. It yeah. would have always, it's, I, I've been, and equally going through Death Valley, good luck finding yourself a, <laughs> a, some twigs to start yeah. cooking your and food. And I'm not taking the piss out of people that use wood burning stoves. I think it's actually awesome. I think it's the same thing. And once again, you got to be really con considerate and considering where you're going to be camping. Yeah. Um, for instance, Canada, USA, yeah, man, that's probably an awesome piece of kit to use. You don't have to carry fuel. You just carry this little box and you put twigs in. <laughs> Perfect. Um, because we got lots and lots of forest around. If they haven't burned down. Yeah, Australia now, maybe not the best time because they lost all their forest. I suppose you don't want to be, I, I don't know, I, I wouldn't want to be carrying a load of twigs with me just in case I can't find any. If I'm in some desert or if I'm somewhere like that. So it really depends on the type of trip you're on. And if you're going on a weekend trip, and you want to pack really light, and you want to be environmentally conscious. That's I think that's wonderful. And if it yeah. works, it works. It's like that caveman feeling of making your own fire. 
I think there's something to be said about that, which does. Yeah, you got to be conscious of the weather too. Like if it's a rainy, mucky, like British weather, you might have a problem lighting that fuel, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Mate, imagine that. It'd be an upset. I've been there trying to start a fire before when it's slightly drizzly. I'm I'm rubbish at it. <laughs> you think I'd be good. the amount of time I've spent away? You think I'd be good at it? But I'm really bad. Uh, it's something I want to get better at, and I think it's, it comes with experience. But if you're not that experienced, it could be quite daunting. Yeah. All right, let's look back at our final questions, uh, our first questions, and uh, see if we've gotten anywhere through our, our banter today. Um, where are you going? How does that play out? I think um, type of fuel, right? So, like we mentioned, you might not have access to gas canisters. So, I think multi fuel stoves, alcohol stoves, definitely your best bet if you're if you're going like like you did on a on a massive anywhere in the world type thing. Yeah. I think it's tried and tested, and there's there's different choices for multi fuel. So like I, I'm I'm biased because I've had good experience with the MSR Whisperlite, but there's other options, the Trangia that you've mentioned, and it'd be quite interesting to try other ones. But ultimately, it's something that fits within your price range, and you know is going to be reliable. I think yeah. they're, they're the two things, and the the fuel choice is probably the biggest consideration I'd be looking at. Mm -hmm. And I think you made a good point before when you said you know. Do you really need to cook? Like, if you're in Southeast Asia, it is dirt cheap to eat out. Yeah. And it saves you a bunch of time. Um, for instance, myself, too, I'm doing some ultra distance racing this summer. I'm not bringing a stove because I got to keep a things ultra light because I'm planning to be on my bike. Like, you're going to be living on, you're going to be living on, Mc, on, on McDonald's, mate. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm McDonald's. I haven't had any in like about six years, so it might happen, but. Who knows? I, I, buy, uh, I buy that. I mean the ice creams. Just the ice creams alone. Are, are, are so oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'll just be eating. Every meal will be eating out. Um, lots of energy bars, protein gel, like right? all these gels and food whenever I can find it. And um, so it's, the, it really comes down to do you need to cook and do you have time to cook? If it kind of fits into those, then don't bother carrying a stove. But otherwise, I think the uh, alcohol stoves, multi fuels. I think bringing a stove, it, it can really give you the uh, options as well, though. So when I was in Southeast Asia, I read a lot on the online about people saying you don't need to bring a stove, don't bring one, the food's cheap. But if I had brought a stove, I think I'd have struggled on the Mei Hon Song loop in the where the route I went from Mei Sot all the way north. There was areas there where we didn't see any towns or villages. For maybe a day or two, depending on your pace. And if yeah. we if we had those stove, we would have struggled with that. And it's the similar question. I know it's not the topic, but with camping gear, it all kind of comes into one. Is like, are you going to camp or are you not going to camp? And it all bringing a stove is linked to that. I think so. It depends on yeah. the type of, of adventure you're on. That's a really good point. I did the main loop, and I didn't bring a stove, but I knew I was going really light. Um, I think I had about five kilos of gear with me, and I was cycling every day, 120 kilometers or so. So I, I always passed towns. I could just grab yeah, food. you were fast when when I saw your pace, and you are you're a quick cyclist, and and you go oh, on a folding bike, on a folding <laughs> bike, man. You you was light, and you were going for it, and you you were doing a a shorter tour, so you knew you could plan it more detail. Whereas I think as well for me, like when I was going into areas of Laos and China in the mountains as well, having that stove, it's just pure morale if you can't find somewhere to cook and you if you're depending on it I, a, a hot meal makes me really happy and i had a rule that i would have at least one hot meal a day but to be honest i no, normally had two and people often I, I met people that would cook hot meals and they'd live on tortilla wraps and peanut butter there's absolutely a place for that don't get me wrong but cooking it makes you happy just get that stove out yeah, and get Oh, oh, the dream. Just some hot, even if it's, yeah, it just, I feel like I can feel the energy going into me as soon as I start cooking. So, yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a good link here. Like, we, we can bring this both back. We both have military experience. I mean, I was just a reservist, but hey, still. Um, but, like, when you're long days and you're tired and you've, you've seen troops time and again when they're exhausted and they're, they're sleep fucked, as we like to say, and you offer them a coffee, how much that just brings them back to life, right? Oh, so it's the same I, when you're yeah. Doing, man. The, Br the British Army functions on brews. Without brews, I think if if people didn't have that access to brews, nothing would get done. I'm a bit weird because I I don't really drink cups of tea 
too often, if I'm being honest. But uh, I'm, I'm the anomaly. Everybody else is living on it. And the, the, re the reason is, is because it makes people happy. And it's a social function as well. So being able to stop, cook something, share, share a brew with a, another bike touring partner that you might have met on the road, and just being able to offer somebody either some coffee or a tea can really break the ice. And I think it's a social function as well. The alcohol burning, in my experience, is really good, but it does use a lot more fuel because it doesn't vaporize the fuel. Um, so shorter trips, I think it's really good, but maybe on a long trip um, where fuel might be hard to find, or you're up in like Alaska, for instance, for eight to ten days, going uh, down the the dead horse from dead horse to town, I think that could be problematic. So having something that uses a um, an alternative fuel, so like your multi fuels or even a canister, because they can last easily a week. There's a so there's a couple there's a couple I've seen on the internet. Uh, they finished their bike trip quite a long time ago. They were a German couple, and I can't remember the name of their channel. It's going to really annoy me. But I once saw them in China, and they'd run out of fuel for their stove, and they were like near on the Tibetan plateau area, okay. really remote. You're struggling, but they had a multi fuel stove, and what they did was take a piece of like garden hose or a piece of tubey hose they found on the road, asked a scooter that had gone past if they can siphon some fuel from their vehicle. He sucked the, the fuel into the pipe and then released it into, into his multi-fuel stove. And that was to, and it was so cold where they were. And without that, they'd have probably really struggled, especially somewhere that remote. So, so for some people, like that multi-fuel stove came into its own there. And having that function to siphon from a vehicle rather than buying it. Uh, so seeing that, and that, I think I might have saw that before I started the bike trip on, on somebody's video. And I was like, right, the multi-fuel stove is a must if you want to go remote. Awesome. Yeah, I think, um, and that comes back to it as well, like everything, like all these questions. Um, I think, personally, I think the multi-fuel stove is the way to go if you have the budget for it. If you don't, I think alcohol stove is really good. I would say if you want a budget, I would get one. I say a budget. I'd get one of them little canister stoves, and um, the little the screwing ones, or even you know what? If you're on a real budget, I don't know the price of the jet boiler comparison right now, but yeah, they they seem to do the job. And and there's there's also the the other brands that we've not mentioned right now. That's true too. Yeah. There's lots of there's lots of cheaper brands. Yeah. There's there's a few recommendations I can see in here. Somebody's recommending the new jet boil jet boil Mino. It's good for cooking and it's got a pan with it. Or the MSR Dragon. So there's loads of stoves that we're not mentioning here, and loads of other brands. Yeah, and yeah, like as, as good as I think the alcohol stove is in terms of weight, I think the, where it struggles is just your fuel usage. So if you're cooking out often, three to four times a day, you want to stop and make a brew. It takes time. Yeah. You use a lot of gas. Um, so as much as I love it, like I need to start to second guess myself today. So. And you don't want a reason to not get it out. If, if it's taking you a long time and you suddenly start to feel a little bit like, oh, I'm getting the stove out. For me, getting the stove out was like one of my favorite times of the day. I'd be like, right, cooking time, let's do it. Nice. All right, so um, conclusions. Do we have any conclusions? I think have you achieved anything? Yeah, <laughs> we've just talked a lot of nonsense about stoves. One thing we didn't mention, just to go back, is pots and pans. And preferences, yeah. I, I I only say this because I went with a traditional pot and pan to start with, like a normal camping pan. You know, one you'd expect to see in a kitchen almost. Oh, I like what you changed to. Yeah, you had a really nice setup. Yeah, I in Alaska in Anchorage bought a Sea to Summit foldable pan. It's got a metal bottom, which is all a bit mucky now from the burning, but it's so good. It's silicon and it folds away, and inside it. I have a bowl, which is like a also a sea to summit bowl. And on that bowl, it can also use it as a chopping board. So within this really compact set, because that's often one of the maybe the plus points of having something like a jet boil over having a stove is the pots and pans are massive. If you're bike packing, how are you going to get a pot and pan on there? It's, it's going to be really difficult. Whereas these foldable pots and pans are the way, way forward, I think. That's a good point. 
Um, I use I use my Trangia stuff, um, but I don't carry all of it. I don't use the windscreen anymore. I don't use the stand because I got the mini stand. I carry just one pot. <clears throat> I carry sometimes I carry the pan if I know I want to be cooking some eggs and stuff. And inside the pot, I carry the stove and um, some spice dishes and stuff because I like to have salt and pepper and uh, oh, the dream. chilies. I yep. like dried chilies too in my food, so um, oh. I carry some crushed red chilies and I have like a little tiny medical, uh, what do you call those? You know, like the, you can buy at the pharmacy or a dollar store or whatever for um, for medicine pills. Oh, pill, pill uh, yeah, so yeah. I screw on top one and keep those full of things I like. Yeah, the pan, the pan I'm using is the 1.4 liter X pot. So if you were to Google that, you'd find it. Uh, it's it's really good. Really, I think, I don't know how much I paid for it. They're not cheap. This is one of the things with it as well. But one of the really good things with it, on the lid, it comes with like a little area where you can uh, sift the pasta. That You know, like it, you put that on top and you tilt it out. So they've thought about it. Uh, mine's a bit cracked and broken from, from sitting on it, but... That in, its, in itself is a super good feature. Are you still there? Did I just lose you? I think I lost you for a second. No. We're back. Okay. We're back. Good. Yeah, I can do that. There is a good feature. Yeah, I think um, I think that pot and pan see the summit set is amazing. I've looked at it as well and considered it for my next adventures, but not this summers because uh, I just won't need any cooking work. Not yeah. Anything. Well, that's, that's, that's really, yeah, it's really dependent on what you're doing, but I, I'd highly recommend it to anybody that's on a big, slow, multi-day adventure. Is And, and you know what? N none of these uh, things we've talked about, we've, just to be clear, we're not sponsored by anybody that we've talked about here. Oh, all, that's true, yeah. All of these kit bits of kit and equipment, it's just what we've used. And I think that that's quite important for people to realize that we're very independent when we talk about yeah, this. Yeah, we're not sponsored yet. <laughs> <laughs> if we were sponsored, we'd have told you about it. <laughs> but if there are any sponsors that are interested, get in touch with Chris. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so anyways, yeah, I think um, really it's those your choice i mean there's so many options out there i think the it depends once again like we said where you're where you're where you're going because if you're in north america or uh western europe maybe even eastern europe gas canisters are probably pretty easy to come by but if yeah. you get into asia and the central asia and stuff good luck you might want to have a multi-fuel stove for alcohol burner. yeah i think that's pretty much it i think uh, another thing is what types of food are you going to be cooking and that's going to be dependent on if you're high budget and you're able to buy rations or, or, or you know, your own little camping meals that you can buy from the shop. Not many people will be doing that. So it's quite expensive. You might want a certain type of stove, like a gas one that's or a jet boil. But if you're going to be, and I would recommend cooking your own like proper food with vegetables and pasta and using local produce, I think you'd want something where you can control the heat, something like the MSR dragon. Is it the dragonfly? Or, yeah, or, or using something something where you can control the heat. I think that's a really important feature. And it's our dragon plant. Just check that. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, yeah, there's some really good options out there. And on that note as well, if you guys have any comments and you're listening to Adam's, uh, you're listening to this via Adam's YouTube live stream, you guys can just comment there and he will definitely get back to you. And the same on this one, if you're listening to the podcast and you guys have comments, I mean, we're kind of doing this as a way to share our experience and we want to get your guys' experience because I mean, there's a lot of you out there that have way more experience than us as well. And, and we value that input. So if you guys have interesting things you want to share or you want to say, fuck off guys, you're wrong, go ahead. So on that, on that, mate, I'll read you out because I know you can't see it right now, but we'll try and get this in the future so you can read the comments as well. We've got um, Brendan Sullivan said, I've been using the MSR Windburner Personal for a few years. Been great, but not that cheap. And I think that's a, a really good point. As a lot of the things we're talking about aren't cheap. And uh, yeah, that's quite interesting. And beer can stove, that's the way to do it. If you want to be cheap, go for it. Cheap They're beer can stove. No, yeah, absolutely no excuses there. And then uh, my friend Mark from Bikepacking has said that he, the Dragonfly Control is really is that's the one he would recommend is a really good okay. tool where the, oh, the yeah the msr dragonfly yeah i've read, I've read um, basically from my reading is the msr whisper light and msr dragonfly 
I mean, this is coming from the Whisper Light uh, or from MSR, but they're two most popular brands that have been used for decades, you know, so. Supple Side um, Down has just commented saying the Whisper Light will simmer with less pressure in fuel bottle. That is good to know. So that's another uh, thing when you put, if you put less pumps into it, um, on, into the, yeah, less pressure into it. That's a really good thing to know. I didn't know that. Um, I might have learned something new there. <laughs> just to raise your pot higher off of the, uh, the the base and that might be in a way to get lower heat as well yeah i wanted to just read one more comment mate uh, that's that's from uh, somebody from thailand dario de lima from thailand is saying they're watching from may hon son in thailand and that is where we that's where we first met so i thought that yeah. was quite appropriate so to throw that in that's really cool yeah we uh, we had a good time there um I was gonna say, man, that, that leaving leaving Pi after meeting you guys and that night uh, that night till like eleven PM or whatever and getting up at four forty five in the morning so like, <laughs> was a tough day for me. Do you know what would be interesting maybe in a future episode is is the foods, our favorite foods from bike tours. And Ooh, that could be good. Yeah, man. oh mate, I could talk about that all day. We could do a three hour special on that one. <laughs> <laughs> But, your favorite cooked foods or favorite foods that you buy and eat that you don't cook all of the all of the above, all yeah. Above. I think just uh, food food on a bike tour could be quite cool in the future. All right, so if you are listening to this, um, do know that it will be a we might get one more episode in before Adam's off, but he's uh, he's going away for work for a few weeks, so uh, we might not have any more episodes until he comes back. But this is something uh, I think we're going to keep forward with it because it's kind of fun and it's good for the listeners. I've definitely not talked this much kit for a long time, and I've I've re- I, I keep fighting the urge to talk about kit. But you know what? I think it's really useful for a lot of people, and if you find use in this, that uh, we've achieved our aim. Is if there's certain topics you guys want us to cover, I know it's just our first episode here of uh, the gear reviews. But if there's certain topics you guys want us to talk about, just write a comment, post, let us know, send us an email. You can contact me at info at bike tour adventures.com. That, uh, that'll go straight to me and I should get back to you soon. Or you can comment in Adam's YouTube or you can comment on the bike tour, uh, the podcast itself. So. And uh, you can check out my website, www.biketouradventures.com, and uh, I'll get these things posted up there, too, in a new section. I haven't started yet. Sounds good, mate. That was good. Enjoyed it. Yeah, really good. Yeah, that was really a, a real pleasure to do. Now it's 7 a.m. here in Canada. i got to get up to go to work. This sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and we, yeah, mate. Is, we, is that as complete with the, the episode? Yeah, I think we're done. Uh, somebody's wrote here, cook six boiled eggs, you get breakfast, lunch, and use water. That's proper cool hand Luke for smashing boiled... Have you ever seen that film? No. It's a, it's, it's a really... You need to watch it, mate. It's great. It's a oh, fil- man, Luke. Yeah, he's, he's in prison and he, has, he ends up eating 50 boiled eggs as a competition. Nice. But yeah, I don't think... Uh, I love a boiling egg, but I don't know if cooking a full pack a day is going to be be good for the... I think the gases you're going to be producing from that are going to be horrendous. Oh, I knew a guy in Sweden, though. He was like a big, big, big dude, like lifted a lot of weights, and he would eat 18 eggs for breakfast. That's <laughs> fucking mental. <laughs> right. This has been really All right. good. All right. Now we're just bantering. So I will talk to you soon, Adam. And uh, yeah. Farewell, well, buddy. In the next few days. Yeah, I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Right. There we go. That is the end of that podcast recording. Whew. So how was that? Um, Chris has gone now. Chris has gone on here. Talks a lot about stoves, pots and pans. My fingers are all like black and grubby from touching this stove. Um, I can now answer some of the comments and questions in there. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed that. That's my first recorded podcast episode for this channel. Um, a bit different. I suppose I'm going to be doing that again. This, I don't know if I'm going to do it on the YouTube all the time, on the YouTube. I don't know if I'm going to be recording these gear reviews. But what I think I'm going to start doing as well is talking a little bit more about gear. Brendan Sullivan enjoyed it. Oh, that's really good. Cheers, mate. Uh, 
Yeah. Oh, Chris is ringing me. Let's see what he's got to say. You all right, mate? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm still on the YouTube live. I, I've not got you on speaker though. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'll close this up. I'll speak to you in a sec. All right, buddy. Yeah. So right, it's uh, twelve o'clock UK time. Uh, quick update in one minute with me and my life. This week I go to Kenya with work, which will be cool, and hopefully we'll get to get some footage of something there. And after that, I'm considering my next options. Uh, I've got some exciting things in the pipeline. Uh, bike packing next show, getting <laughs> just like reading that already. Getting laid a single tour, tour, single cycle tour in the world. You will watch that, mate. That sounds like you want to watch my sex videos. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, there's a there's a lot going on in my life. I've been back in the UK for two months, and it's exciting to be back. I've got loads on. This is a cool thing that I put in my last video. I made this is like a collection of things from my bike tour, and over here is the ooh, that's the flag that I got made in Alaska. Yeah, I go to Kenya next week. I'll be there for 17 days, and then after that, I've got a load of bits of time off work. So I'm going to be looking doing a bank trip i don't know where yet i'm thinking two options uk not a uk if i do in the uk I might go to scotland but if i leave the uk because it's going to be march april time i'm thinking about going to northern africa to go to morocco do that for two three weeks we will see not decided um cool gonna have a beer um Mate has said, in Europe, for shorter tours, I'm using Decathlon Sturm and Gas. For longer tours, Primus Omnilite. That sounds really good, mate. Uh, Norway, March, April. Don't think I want warmth, mate. I love it when it's hot. <laughs> right, I'm going to go phone Chris, speak to him, and then I'm going to go and have some lunch. Enjoy your day. Thanks for joining, and I'll see you on the next one. Farewell. Goodbye. <laughs>